tour in the Assassin's Creed Odyssey Discovery Mode. So this is just a small overview of the ancient Acropolis and what it would have looked like in the 5th century BCE, which was at this point at about from 460 to 430 BCE. And as we can see from this brief overview, the ancient citadel was right here in the heart of the city of Athens. And that's actually kind of how it got its name. Acropolis is made up of two words. Akron, meaning highest point, and polis, meaning city, so it's the highest point in the city. So as we fly around, we can kind of just see some of the buildings that we will get into briefly. So we have the Propylaea right here. We have the Erechtheion there. We have the Parthenon there. And then we have some of these storage buildings, a treasury of... Artemis, I believe, is here, and some priestly buildings. <clears throat> oh, it's just beautiful. All right, and with that, we will start our tour. So the first thing you would see when you come up on the Acropolis uh, is the Propylaea, which is the monumental gate made out of marble and limestone that would be welcoming you and act as a de facto very light security checkpoint, basically restricting access to some of the holiest parts of Athens. So as we would come through, the first thing you would see is the giant 40 foot tall statue of Athena, Athena Promachus. So that's Athena who fights on the front line. Um, it was dedicated to Athenians who had fought in either the Battle of Marathon or the Persian Wars. I don't remember which one at this moment. But she was uh, 40 feet tall, made all of bronze, and she was made by the sculptor Phidias. Very, very famous. And she was... Uh, let's see... Let's see if we can climb on top of her, because I should be able to to get a better vantage point. But sometimes this game is finicky and hates when I try to climb. So we'll see. And I'm sure she would have... Oh, no. I'm sure she would have been very slippery. Um, let's see. Oh. Yeah. As all bronze, I'm sure this would be very, very slippery and slick to try to climb on. So I do not... <laughs> I do not blame our little Cassandra right here for having trouble climbing the statue. So we can see that her helmet is like extremely shiny. And if we look this way, over there, that should be the port of Piraeus, which was the harbor of Athens, both then and now. Uh, changed significantly, obviously, in the modern day. But this statue was so shiny and so bright that when the sun hit the helmet, the bronze helmet, uh, it would have shined and glinted so brightly that ships coming into the port would have been able to see her kind of standing here like a giant flashlight or a giant beacon. Um, so if you were coming to trade or if you were coming home, you would have been able to see her. And between here and the actual port, this is, give or take, this is about 10 miles or so. So that's quite a distance that you could really see her just sort of shining up and lighting your way. Um, and you would have been able to see her from a lot of the surrounding areas too as well. So, um, All right. So after that, if you were, depending on who you were, you would come and the first thing you would see is the east side of the most famous building the Parthenon. <clears throat> so there's a few things I can say about this just having earned a degree with an emphasis on Greek architecture but also history. Um, this is a beautiful recreation of the temple but there are a few details that stand out to me. So if we're gonna take our little eagle mode. So this part of the temple right here is called the pediment 
and these little squares with images in them would have been called metopes. And so historically, what you would have on this temple is on one of the pediments you would have the mythical founding of Athens, uh, so the story of how the city was founded by its very first king, King Kekrops. Um, and then on the other pediment, you would have had the contest between Athena and Poseidon, uh, the contest for patronage of Athens, where Athena presented an olive tree to the citizens of Athens, and Poseidon presented a uh, saltwater spring. And then in these little metopes, also on the Parthenon, you have the Gigantomachy and the Titanomachy, which is the war between the gods and both the Titans and the Giants. Um, these also would have been marble, because these are essentially what the Elgin marbles are that were ripped off and why we're fighting the British Museum for them. Uh, so in the game, I understand this creative choice, but these are all wrong. Uh, these are not any of those things. The This is very much just like a a formula, you can tell this was plugged in to make it look nice, uh, but they definitely were not bronze. Um, and these shields eventually would have, they would have eventually had shields here on the Parthenon, uh, but not during the 5th century. I believe Alexander the Great in the 4th century was the one who, uh, when he conquered a new uh, region, location, leader, he would send shields back to Athens and they would be placed upon the Parthenon. So it's very pretty and it's nice to look at, um, but it's not at all accurate, unfortunately. So this could, this is just historians being pedantic about wanting the smallest details just right. For casual gamers, you probably wouldn't notice, but it's nice to look at um, either way. So heading into the east side of the Parthenon. Uh, this is actually the treasury of Athens. So in the game here we have what looks to be like piles of money and vases and shields and you have some brazers in here. You have one chest and then it's a bunch of just little items. Uh, yes, this is where the treasury would be held. I'm pretty sure it would have not been quite this disorganized um, because the treasury was split into two different parts. So half of this money in here would have been used exclusively for religious activities. So the priests could have used this money to buy animals for sacrifice um, and other sort of materials that they would need for their religious rituals and any other kind of festivals, so funding probably for a lot of materials and foods and other things uh, and, and to pay for crafted works uh, for things like the Great Panathenea, the four-year festival. Um, yeah, that's so half of that is what would have been used from here. And then the other half was actually just money that belonged to the city. So whatever kind of domestic costs the Athenians would have incurred, uh, their money was basically in here and you would come and get that and that's what you would use to pay. I do not believe that the money held from the Delian League, which is to say the collection of city-states that uh, Athens kind of bullied into staying together to help defend them from enemies would have been in here. Uh, I believe it would have been held in one of the other little buildings out here um, that could have been heavily guarded since you would not want to misplace either your money and the money of all your allies, which Athens really just used for themselves uh, and then told everyone that the money they were using from everyone's combined money would have gone to their collective defense. But um, yeah, we know Athens. Um, oh, interesting. Okay, so that's not really an altar right here, but um, interesting. So we're going to run around now to the west side of the Parthenon, which is where most normal citizens would have gone. Um, <clears throat> you wouldn't really go in the treasury if you were just like a random Athenian, especially if you were poor. Oh, you would definitely not go there. So on this side, again, you would have the other... So this is kind of very much the same this is actually identical to what we had on the other side i believe so again not historically accurate which is fine um it's a game so i'm going to point out going up 
in this inner row of columns right here. We're going to climb on it if we can. Can we climb? Can we climb up here? Yes, we should be able to. So the festival I mentioned, the Great Panathenaea, which w was held every four years, was the great celebration celebrating Athena as the patron goddess. And so this this is where the the frieze, the famous frieze, would have been. So this is a beautifully colored. Um, <laughs> image, which is just the same repeated image over and over, and uh, in reality, it would it would have not been the same image. But um, yeah, essentially, it, it would have been a representation of the great procession that would have gone on around the city and up to the Acropolis as they are preparing to come and finish the festival up on the Acropolis. But it's beautiful to look at, and I love the intentionality that they. Um, placed on it because if you're a normal person unless you look straight up you're not even going to see it one and then two even if you're looking straight up at this you're never going to see it kind of the way we are now just looking straight on you would always be looking up like that which is kind of odd but they spared no expense this is a beautiful temple that the gods would know the gods would see and thus every inch of it was going to be perfect so now heading right into the inner chamber or the cella, we have the Athena Parthenos. She is a 40 foot tall statue. She is what we would call chryselephantine, which is really just gold and ivory. Um, she, the statue was said to have a, a wooden base actually. So under all that wood, under that ivory and gold would have been like a skeleton kind of, of wood. And when things there are rumors that when things didn't go well for the city, um, mice would actually kind of live in and crawl around the wood. So you can imagine what kind of eerie sounds you might have heard from mice kind of crawling around there. As you can see, her drapery is pretty much all gold. These would have been gold plates. Uh, and so when Athens was down on its luck and if someone needed money, you could essentially come take gold plates off of her. So essentially you're taking layers of her clothing off of her. So I like to think of this as a bank, like she was an ancient bank, an ancient ATM to be precise. Um, yeah, poor thing, because she's she's beautifully sculpted. Um, she w This is probably the most beautiful masterpiece of Phidias's uh, entire sculpting career and so to have her use as an ancient ATM was kind of sad to me. Um, I will point out here that this little thing right here, this little pool of water, is kind of ingenious because this little pool of water was, we think, here to control the humidity of the room and so essentially that turns it into an ancient humidifier which is my favorite fun fact of this entire, like, I think it's my favorite fun fact of the entire game. I don't know. It's a great one because most people have no idea. And it wasn't very common because not all temples had this. Most temples didn't have this, but this was no ordinary temple. This was a very special place. So no expenses were spared. And I'll also point out that right here, this is also the frieze that would have been on the outside of the building, not on the interior of the building. And it again is uh, the same image kind of copy pasted all around. Very interesting choice, um, but it's fun to see nonetheless, even if it is in the wrong place and not really the whole thing. And then most sacrifices were not made inside temples contrary to popular belief um altars were really held like in front or next to temples um because it would be an open air sacrifice so your sacrifice would go straight up to the gods in mount olympus um so it's interesting to me that they don't have an altar right out in front it's a very interesting choice there are there should be at least one or two altars up here in the game um, but there would have been more and the placement would have been different in ancient times. So running around here, the Great Panathenaea would actually end in front of this little temple. This temple is called the Erechtheion. Uh, it 
it's an atypical temple. It's a really cool temple. So essentially this temple was dedicated to Athena and Poseidon because it housed cult statues of each of the gods uh, for whom competed for patrons of the city. So the Great Panathenea's procession would end right here in front of this building. And as we enter, we're going to see... So this statue isn't, to my knowledge, this isn't actually correct. So they just put a nice bronze and ivory cult statue to Athena in here to get the idea across that it's a sanctuary dedicated to her. Great. Um, but this statue would have been smaller. Uh, you would have been able to carry it pretty easily with two or three people. And I think it mostly would have been made out of wood uh, because as an essential part of ending the Great Panathenaic procession would be to come here to the temple and then to ceremonially dress the statue in real clothes. So you would have put a peplos tunic on her uh, and yes, you, you would have dressed the statue. You were dressing the goddess uh, before you did any of the sacrifices and rituals outside at the altar. So um, this is nice, but not a thing. So running out to the south side yes here you they have an altar here so here you would have made the like right on here is where you would have made the sacrifices uh you'd probably sacrifice a great bull um if this were nighttime which is usually by the time the procession ended it would be nighttime so these braziers would be lit and then yes you have other food and then you have look to be you can put drinking jars, jugs, any other kind of dedicated things. There might have been one or two votive offerings, votives being just little statuettes um, that you would dedicate in the shape of a god, or sometimes there's votive horses and other little figurines of people you may know. I'll go into that ceremonial worship stuff. So, um, interesting. But yes, so there's the altar in the game. And then, this over here is the Porch of the Caryatids. So this is said to be the tomb of Kekrops, the first king of Athens. Um, you know, who knows if his tomb is actually under here? <laughs> um, but that's just mythologically where it's said to be. One thing I want to point out is that if these look familiar, if you are familiar, if you have lived in or traveled to uh, Chicago, where I am from. The Museum of Science and Industry in Hyde Park actually has its own like replica version of the Porch of the Caryatids. It's not painted at all. It's just that sort of um, grayish color that the rest of the marble, I believe, museum is constructed out of. But here we have a pretty good visual representation of the original. These are painted, um, but actually these would have been painted in even brighter, more garish, psychedelic colors. Uh, I spoke with someone who had a hand in creating the game who said that they actually had to tone down and take out a lot of the original bright coloring just to save players' eyes, <laughs> and they wouldn't fit with the light filters perfectly, um, so it made the game look a little wonky. So I understand that completely. Um, I appreciate that they've painted them and not just left them the color that they are today, which is just that white marble. But yes, these would have been much more brightly colored than even here. Creative choice. I get it. Cool. Uh, and then over here is the sacred olive tree. So this olive tree right here is an olive tree that the Athenians believed was the one that Athena gave to the Athenians when winning her contest. So uh, the tree that's there today was actually planted in 1952, I believe, um, by folks at the American School of Classical Studies uh, to maintain it. I know that, I, or I believe that olive trees can live for hundreds of years, I believe. Um, and so this is obviously not the original one, but back in the 5th century, I still don't believe it's the original one by any means, but the Athenians believe that it was at least descended from the original gift from Athena. And so this tree, not only is it gorgeous in where it is, but the olives on it would have served one of two purposes. The Athenians could have taken the olives to make ancient olive oil, one, and then two, 
uh, they would have been able to take the olives and make oil and when competing in ancient sports in ancient Greece um, obviously back then it was all men who could compete only men and all of these sports would have been competed naked essentially uh, so they would use the oil to oil up their bodies so that way they smelled nice and that their bodies were slick and lean and they believed that it really accentuated the, the musculature the muscles of the ath athletes competing so there were so many different kinds of ancient sports that they could have competed in back then and it depended on where they were and, and the time so obviously the ancient Olympics were not done here in Athens they were done in Olympia but they would have had smaller foot races they would have had uh, some combination of boxing and wrestling and then uh, there was actually a, a, an old sport called the pancration which was literally a combination of boxing and wrestling together as one element and so it probably wouldn't have felt very good uh, to be fighting with someone <laughs> without a little oil on them also it just made the feet better because you're very slick when you have the oil so to try to pin someone down and win a contest while your opponent is very slippery made the feet all the more impressive um, and so it was just a way to show off your strength and your your body um, and you would have smelled really nice on top of it so yay for oiling up So the last part, I will say, is in the background of the game, we can hear people either singing or talking in Greek. Uh, I will say, unfortunately, a lot of this is not ancient Greek. Um, there are elements of ancient Greek words that I can pick up when I play the game, if I happen to pass someone. But it takes the immersion away a little bit when I hear a lot of what they're speaking comes out with a very modern accent. And what I mean by that is there are a few notable differences between ancient and modern Greek. Essentially, the biggest ones are a couple of letter combinations. There's a lot more ways and, and um, instances where you would have the sound E in modern Greek than you would in ancient. And then there's certain letters that do not sound the same anymore. So quick examples I can give would be anything you see in ancient Greek that ends in OI instead of something like poloi you would have poli um, because OI is now an E sound um, so there's about six or seven different ways to make the E sound in modern Greek which just was not very common in ancient and then when I mean by letters uh, in ancient Greek Betas, the B sound, and the delta, so the D sound, would have been B and D in ancient. But in modern, the B becomes a V sound or a V, and the D delta sound would have become a Th, T-H. So instead of Dios for God, it is now Theos for God in, in modern. So it's just running around and kind of hearing this very modern pronunciation is a little distracting, but it's really, that's that's me being a language nerd. That's me being a little pedantic about my language and just wanting everything to be right. Um, but these are very minor things that regular just casual explorers would not have um really noticed at all and then some of the like buildings we just didn't cover um are like this this is like a little uh priest house so this is where they could rest and prepare themselves for any religious activities this is where they could eat or rest and yeah it basically just a nice guest house um which would be right across from here which is kind of just like your big storage area where you could store any number of things gear uh you might have had an animal or two not very long just briefly just um to keep it somewhere um when you're planning on sacrificing it and then uh, last thing i'll do is i'll kind of run us back through the propylaea and because it's so beautiful the last thing I'll mention is here. This is the Temple to Athena Nike. 
And so this temple would not have been finished during this time. I don't even think it would have been this level of unfinished. So they kind of took liberties with this. This was finished a good, what, 10 something, 10 plus years later, I believe. But it's kind of fun to see. Um, so this was, this, this essentially was created also because it had, quote unquote, some of the best views to the Aegean, so looking this way, that is the port of Piraeus again. So in mythology, Theseus, our young hero of Athens, who goes to Crete and defeats the Minotaur, he famously told his father, the king of Athens, that he would either raise a white or a black sail to announce whether he had died or whether he had returned victorious uh, in defeating the Minotaur. And so his father, day after day, came out here and waited to see his son or his son's ship. And so when Theseus eventually did come back, he forgot to essentially put up the right color sail. So his father thought he died, and because of that, his father, who did not wish to live if his son was dead, famously threw himself off of the wall, which would have been kind of just like jumping down here. Now, I guess another last thing is this giant switchback that we have here. It is very pretty, but it was not here during the 5th century. I mean, we're talking 460 to 430. This switchback did not come, I believe, until Roman times, which is when it was put in. So this would have been actually just like a straight shot incline up to the Acropolis. So this looks really pretty in the game, and I, I do really like this. It just wasn't there during this time. So that you know, it's it's just a little kernel. Um, but yeah, so this is a really brief sort of introductory tour to the Acropolis. I hope you've learned some kernels of cool uh, historical facts, little art history facts, a um, little bit about language. There's so much to do and see in this game. Honestly, I could probably go on for hours and I probably have a billion other tidbits from other locations in this game that in the future I hopefully will be making short videos and doing brief overviews so I hope you've enjoyed this and I will see you guys hopefully next time